Graduates, I have the honor of introducing today's commencement speaker. Her official biography is in your program. However, every time I've spoken with Dr. Yasmin Davids, I've become more and more impressed with her. Not only are her accomplishments, but also her humility that she displays in the midst of her success. Given her worldwide reach, I am happy that she has chosen to spend today with us and with you. Moreover, with all that we are facing these days, what more important skill can we have right now than empowering women to learn to negotiate for themselves? As an institution that has nearly 60% females in its student population, this is essential. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Yasmin Davids. Wow. I'm supposed to be here to inspire all of you, and all of you are inspiring me. You look so beautiful out there, and your family here, faculty and staff, you are truly an inspiration. I am here today to share my life story and hopefully help you be able to understand that failure in life is truly the greatest gift if you look for the gift. I grew up in a very dysfunctional family. My parents came from Quito, Ecuador, mi papá, and my mom came from Chihuahua, Mexico. Second and third grade education, they came to provide their children with a better life. However, my father was very abusive towards my mother and us. And we suffered emotional, physical, and sexual abuse within our household. At the age of five, I asked my mom, Mommy, por qué? Por qué mi papá puede hacer tantas cosas si tú no? Why, Mom? Why is it that da Dad can do so much and, and you can't? You can't even respond without abuse. And she said, mija, that's just the way things are. Así son las cosas, mija. And I said, oh, no, mami. When I grow up, I'm going to change the world and make it better for women. I was five years old. I didn't know what I was thinking. Obviously, I, I was very bold. And she said, que bueno, mijita, y como? That's great, daughter, how? And I said, I don't know, mommy. I'm just going to do it. I mean, this is America. We can do whatever we want. And she said, OK, mijita. And she smiled. At the age of eight, I went to my mother. And I said, mommy, por que no lo dejas, mommy? Why don't you leave him? And she said, mijita, no sé el idioma. I don't know the language, the English language. I am not educated. I don't have any skills. We will live on the streets if I leave you, if I leave your father. We will live on the streets and your sisters and you will not get the education that you deserve and should get. But whatever you do, don't ever be like me. Get your education. Go to school. Make sure that you depend only on yourself so that you can thrive. Because your grandmother told me that all I had to do was to be a good wife and I would be taken care of. But no one ever told me the price I had to pay in order to live. I remember looking at my mom that day and thinking to myself, I am going to become the most educated Latina that you can ever think of. It is no surprise I got my PhD. At the age of 20, my father tried to kill us, tried to kill our family. Of course, we survived. We're all here. But I fell into a very deep depression after that. I was at San Diego State getting my undergraduate degree and I fell into a chemical depression. I didn't know what that was at that time. I just knew that everything in my body hurt. I couldn't move, I couldn't get out of bed. I had post-traumatic stress disorder. Yet, I went to the doctors on campus and they said there was nothing wrong with me. So I would go in my room and I would close the door, I would close all the blinds, and I didn't really care to talk to anyone because I had literally chemicals in my brain had shifted. And I did not know what that was, I didn't know that I needed antidepressants. I didn't know that there was a better way. All I knew was that every day I cared less to live. 
At that time, I received a letter in the mail. I had applied to USC Marshall School of Business, my dream school, before everything happened with my father. I received that letter and it said, congratulations, you have a Fulbright scholarship to USC. So I said, God, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I can't get out of bed, but I'm going to USC. I got up that summer. I went home, back home to my mom's house. And every day, I became more depressed. Until one day, I really didn't care to live. And I said, God, please help me find the strength to get up and do something, or give me the strength to kill myself. Thank God he gave me the strength to get up and do something However, I, I called one of my friends and I said, look it, I know I've been the president of the D.A.R.E. program my entire life. And I've always said no to drugs. But I know you guys do something to stay up sometimes and never offer me because you know I'll lecture you. But I need to get out of bed. Please help me. She went and took me and I became addicted to drugs. I started using methamphetamine in order to get out of bed. I self-medicated. I started USC. I was ashamed. I was a closet user. No one knew that I was using methamphetamine in order to get up and function, take a shower, go to class, work three jobs on campus, and get to class, and then come home and do it all over again tomorrow. And everyone said, wow, you're such a powerful Latina, you're on the dean's list, your father just tried to kill you, and you're thriving in school. And I felt like a fraud, because I didn't know if I was a strong, powerful Latina, or if I was just a woman who couldn't get out of bed without taking drugs. So I negotiated with God, and in my mind, see, I was a great negotiator. I said, God, I know I shouldn't be doing this, and I'm very ashamed, but in the Christmas vacation, I'm going to get off of it because I don't want to do this. I just need you to help me have strength to get out of bed. And in my mind, God said, I got you. Go for it. <laughs> Christmas vacation came, and I slept for days to get off of the drug. And when I woke up, every bone in my body, every piece of myself hurt. I was in so much pain, and I ran to the bathroom, and I did methamphetamine. And I thought to myself, that was the scariest moment of my life because no longer was I just depressed. Now I was addicted. So I spent the next six months calling any place that would, that would take a call from me saying, I need help. I need to get off this drug. I need treatment. Somebody please help me. They said, are you under 18? I said, no. They said, um, you know, are you a single mother that, you know, and I said, I'm a student at USC. All I want is a loan. I'm graduating with a business degree. I will you know, pay back. I just need help to go to rehab for a little bit. I'll be back. And they wouldn't, nobody would help me because I didn't have any money. So the day that I decided that I could no longer live because it had gotten even worse, I was driving at that time. It's called a Suzuki Samurai. I know all you young folks here don't know what that is, but there was these Jeeps that would flip. Everybody back here knows what I'm talking about, right? So I was driving by the Universal Studios, and I was planning how I was going to make the car flip so that nobody would blame my mommy for my death. Because el que dirán, you know, what people are going to say was everything, right? So by the grace of God and the first miracle in my life, I got off on Universal City Drive. I went to a payphone. At that time, there was payphone guys, yeah. No cell phones yet. And I called suicide a hotline, and it said, sorry, disconnected to insufficient government funds. And I thought to myself, if I live, I'm going to run for Congress. I'm going to be in Congress. I'm going to make sure all the suicide lines work. I ended up finding there was a, a piece of paper in my wallet that I had kept there. It was a woman named Laura that I had spoken to on the phone for 30 minutes one day, and she said, I'm not supposed to give you my home number. It was a crisis line. She said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it to you. I had kept it in my wallet. I found it that morning. It was a Thursday morning at 6 a.m., and I called her. And she answered. I said, Laura, I don't wanna live anymore. I wanna die. Please help me. And she said, I've been teaching yoga for seven years every Thursday at 6 a.m. My alarm clock didn't go off this morning. I know I said it last night. 
I'm supposed to be here for you. Don't move. I'm going to come get you. A stranger picked me up and took me to a re rehabilitation center. She saved my life. A stranger did. I went into treatment, and the first thing I said is, how long is it going to take to fix me? Because I got things to do, people to see places to go. I got to take care of my mommy, my little sister, and they said, hey, no one's making you stay here. Go out there. I said, oh, I tried it on myself. I forgot I tried it on my, and it didn't work. So the next 30 days were the most beautiful days of my life and the most difficult ones. But what I found in this treatment center was community. I found 12 other people from a CEO of Fortune 100 company to a 16-year-old homeless young boy, and we were all there to thrive, to strive, and to stay alive. And our purpose there was to support one another because we each had a story. So I shared with you these three stories of my life for a reason, and that is because the first story of my father and when I was five years old, many people would think that he, would, he failed me, right? but I don't see it that way. My father gave me a gift. Although he was mentally ill and what he did was wrong, he gave me the gift of purpose. Because at five years old, I found my life purpose to empower and develop women, and that's what I did for the last 35 years. <laughs> the story of my mother at eight years old, people would think your mother failed you. I said, no. My mommy, I love my mommy. She lives with me, she lives with my sister. She's a beautiful woman and has a big heart. My mother taught me empathy. She taught me compassion. She taught me when I looked at her, she truly wanted to leave. She didn't feel she had the strength to do it. So many women out there and men feel they don't have the strength to do what they need to do. And I wanted to, at eight years old, say, Mommy, and I did tell her, Mommy, si puedes, you could, we're here for you. And she's like, Mijita, I can't. And I learned that everybody's on their own journey. And everybody has their own path, and we are not to judge, ever, anyone, for what they're going through. <laughs> she also gave me the greatest gift of all, which is the gift of the value of education. That day, I decided I would get my PhD, and so I did. And finally, the third story about Rehabilitation Center. People would see that as a personal failure, but I see it as the greatest gift of all, and let me tell you why. When I found community there and realized that it saved my life, I realized that I had been traveling alone on this journey of life, and the pain and the loneliness was what caused me to not want to live anymore. But the moment I had other people with me on this struggle was the moment I had purpose to want to get better for myself and for them. So when I left there at the age of 22, I decided that whatever company I would have, because I would have many companies, that whatever I did, whatever nonprofit I created, because I was going to create one, and however I was going to change the world, it was going to be with community. So every organization I have now Every program that I have, leadership program for women and for men, it is all based on helping each other rise. The women in our programs will not get accepted unless they're committed to helping other women rise with them. They, will, they want to develop themselves, but they also need to be committed to developing and helping other women and men because we cannot do it alone. And for the last 20 years, building community has been the purpose of my life with empowering and developing women. And now we're going global with it. And we will change the world, one woman and men at a time, but we'll do it with community helping each other. So don't ever feel that failure is truly failure, because every failure, there is a gift. There's a gift in every failure of people that have failed you and in your own personal failure. You just need to find that gift and don't ever, ever be ashamed. I am proud of what I've been through. I am not ashamed. I am proud of being a Latina survivor. And I will forever and ever be grateful to my father, my mother, and my addiction for who I am today. Thank you.
We have an, uh, want to give Mr. B some love. Just share for sharing her story. Please give her a hand, please. <laughs> 